Saturday is going to be one hell of a day. We have both NFL and college football going off. We have some riding games, but more importantly, we have championships for college football this weekend. I want to look at some of those games, starting first with the AAC championship. You have Tulsa versus Cincinnati, who is a 14-point home favorite. The total in this game is 45 and a half. This line did open at 15 and has ticked down, and the total at 46 also ticked down. The college football playoff committee gave Cincinnati a big ol' middle finger by dropping them in the rankings, indicating that absolutely no, they will not be considered for the college football playoffs, even if they do beat Tulsa in the title game. Iowa State, who has two losses on the season, jumped ahead of the Bearcats, who is 8-0. I am definitely not one to look at motivation, but I wouldn't blame anyone for looking at motivation in this spot. You have two questions to ask yourself. Number one, do they rip Tulsa a new one to show everyone that yes, they absolutely deserve to be in the top four, or do they forego the effort since the playoffs is not looking at them as an option. If it was me, I want to absolutely destroy the competition. Always, every weekend, I show up. But look, can Tulsa even contend here in this spot? Looking at the Tulsa's best defense, their defensive strength is in the passing game, and they have played two passing teams. They first played UCF, who averages 373 passing yards, 9.1 yards per pass, and 44 points per game. They held them to 330 yards, 6.5 yards per pass, and 26 points. But I don't know if you saw that game. It was one hell of a sloppy performance from UCF. They never really had a chance because they were they had turnover after turnover. It was ugly. But then they did play SF. Mu, who averages 334 yards, 8.6 yards per pass, and 37 points per game. They held them to 200 yards, 5.6 yards per pass, and 24 points. Yes, this defense is absolutely good. What we also know is that neither UCF or SMU has a defense of their own. Both of these teams rank 117 and 100 in total defense. We also know that Cincinnati isn't a pass-first team. They run and they run well. So now let's look at Tulsa against the run. Cincinnati is 11th best in the country, averaging 228 rushing yards, 4th best averaging 5.8 yards per carry. They did hold Chubba Hubbard to 93 yards and 3.4 yards per rush, but if you remember that game, that was the opening game of the college football season, and their quarterback did end up getting out injury in their first drive. Momentum shifted, never stood a chance. They did hold UCF's Otis Anderson at 284 yards, but 4.9 yards per rush. They gave up 118 yards and 5.6 yards per rush to East Carolina's Rajay Harris in a game that Tulsa should never have even won. Just look it up. Terrible bad beat for anyone who is holding an East Carolina money line ticket. They gave up 106 yards, 4.2 yards per rush to Tulane's Stefan Hutterson. This defense is letting up each game, and this is the first true run-heavy team that they have faced. The difference between those opponents and Cincinnati is that Bearcats don't have just one running back. They have a mobile quarterback in Desmond Ritter, and he is the team's second leading rusher. With his legs, he averages 7.9 yards per rush and has 11 touchdowns on the ground to his 16 passing touchdowns. Tulsa's defense vulnerability is against the run. Cincinnati's offensive strength is on the ground. Tulsa's best offense is also in the passing game, and we absolutely know what Cincinnati does to passing teams. Shuts them down. Unfortunate for Tulsa, their quarterback, Zach Smith, has six interceptions. He has been sacked 10 times. Cincinnati has forced 13 interceptions and has 24 sacks to their defense. Looking at the only two teams to contend with Cincinnati, Army, who is fourth best rushing attack in the country and has a defense that can contain, UCF, who is a top five total offense, Tulsa is neither of these things. So Tulsa's only hope here is to keep this as a defensive game. This is a similar matchup in where Cincinnati versus UCF in that both teams give the ball away a lot and both teams are great in takeaways. So it'll come down to who has a clean game. Now that the line is at 14, this is a buy for me. I do think that this could be an under game as well. What I like more though is Tulsa team total under 7.5 in the first half. If you look at their stats, Tulsa is dead last in scoring in the first quarter and 121st in the first half. In seven games played, they have scored 12 points total in the first quarter with four games having scored zero and in five games scored seven points or less in the first half. The two games that they didn't was against UCF and a blowout 42-13 win over South Florida. 
Moving over to the ACC, we have the big game that everyone is looking forward to watching, myself included. It is the rematch. We have Clemson minus 10.5 versus Notre Dame. The total for this is 59.5. This total did drop from the 61.5 opening, and there's been no movement to the spread. This is definitely a big game for both. If Clemson wins, then Notre Dame could potentially drop in the playoff rankings, but still remain in the top four. If Notre Dame wins, Clemson would drop out of the top four and instead be considered for the New Year's Six. We actually don't really know what the committee is going to do, so we're not going to guess. Just know that it is important for both. (laughs) You could say, oh, but Trevor Lawrence is back. But now you got to ask yourself, how much better could Trevor Lawrence actually perform to his backup? DJ Wagagale threw 439 yards. He had 66% completion, 10 yards per pass, two touchdowns, zero interceptions. How much more of an upgrade is Trevor Lawrence really? Looking at that pass rush, that Notre Dame pass rush is and was the game changer against North Carolina, but that could be a lot less effective here in this game. Lawrence has been sacked a total of 11 times, eight of which came against some of the best pass rushing teams in the country. Yet he still threw for 403, 329, and 351 yards, has six touchdowns to zero interceptions in those games. As good of a pass rush Notre Dame has been, Clemson is even better. This defense has forced 38 sacks compared to Notre Dame's 38, 28 as noted. Trevor has been sacked 11 times to Ian Book's 17, and this will be the best pass rush that Ian Book has faced, though he did already face them already, as we know. So then who can handle the pressure? Now that we have more stats under their belt, Ian Book does actually hold the edge with 49% completion, 76% adjusted. Lawrence has just 37% completion, 53% adjusted. So now let's look at their run game. Clemson last year was a top 20 rushing attack in both yardage and averaged six yards per rush. They were second best in the country. This year, Clemson is 72nd in rushing yards and averaging just 4.3 yards per rush. Travis Etienne, who was once considered a Heisman contender at the beginning of the season, he is great for rushing touchdowns. He has 12 to his name. But in terms of production, he's definitely not being utilized this season. In 10 games, he's had below 80 rushing yards in six. He's topped 100 yards just twice, and the last time was in early October. Regardless, Notre Dame was able to hold him to 1.6 average in the first matchup. And Notre Dame has faced, even then, Louisville, who is ranked 27th and averages 5.2 yards per rush and held them to 96 rushing yards and 4.2 yards per rush in a low 12-7 win. Versus North Carolina, who is ranked 8th best in yardage, They average 6.6 yards per rush. They are second best. They held them to 87 rushing yards and 2.9 yards per rush. So yes, this run defense is definitely legit, but does it even matter if they're going to be slinging it around? Looking at Clemson, we did see them just roll 45 to 10 on a top 10 run team in Virginia Tech. The difference with them and Notre Dame now is that the Hokies are 109th in total defense. They never had a shot in that game because their defense is not able to hold Trevor Lawrence in check. And then I look at what this Notre Dame defense was able to do against one of the top passing attacks in the country in North Carolina. They shut them out in the second half and held them to 58 yards in the second half. 58 yards. If you know Clemson will go pass heavy, can Notre Dame stop the aerial attack? The two passing teams that they faced, they gave up 6.8 yards per pass to Boston College. 31 points, and got ripped in the first half against North Carolina. In that first half, they allowed 152 passing yards, 19 yards per pass, and 17 points. They gave up multiple big plays. They had a 51-yard pass and two 20-plus yarders. But as I mentioned, that defense went into the locker room in that half and adjusted and shut them out entirely in the second half. This will be the best team in total defense that Clemson has faced. I think Notre Dame has been improving week after week. Notre Dame is 15th, and the best that Clemson has faced is Pitt, ranked 39th, and we saw them win 52-17. to The difference with that is that Pitt is one-dimensional passing offense. They have zero ground game. We know that Notre Dame can both pass and run. And if Ian Book needs to sling it, he definitely can. This team is 53 in passing yards. They choose to run first, but he is top 30 for yards per pass, averaging 8.3 and just two interceptions to his name. He himself has definitely developed as a good quarterback. Ian Book and company will have to play a clean game. On top of those two interceptions, this team does have 12 fumbles, 8 lost. Clemson is top 10 in takeaways, forcing 13 interceptions and 11 fumbles, but they do have some fumble luck with 9 recovered. 
This game will be played at the Carolina Panther Stadium. Weather is looking good. I think this is a great spot for Notre Dame to kind of show themselves that, yes, they are a legit defense. So I'm going to be looking to take Notre Dame plus 10 and a half, and I'm going to be a little bit bold and say plus 315 on the money line. If that defense is exactly as good as it was against North Carolina, they win. In one of the least exciting games that we have this weekend is the Big Ten Championship. We have Northwestern playing Ohio State, who is a 20 and a half favorite. The total for this game is 57 and a half. There's no movement on the spread, and the total has dropped from the 58 and juiced to the under. These two teams have been playing since 19. 19- 13. I don't think I've seen any two teams with more history than these two. For the first five years, the Wildcats were outscored 182 to 3. In the last five years, the Wildcats were outscored 206 to 87, including a 52 to 3 blowout last year. So literally almost nothing has changed. Northwestern's last win was in 2004, 33 to 27, and before that, 1971. History is definitely not on their side. But let's look at this game. Can they rewrite their story this time around? Looking at Northwestern's defense, Ohio State is ranked 6th best in total offense. They average 532 yards per game and 7 yards per play. They are ranked ninth best in that stat. Even against one of the better defenses they faced in Indiana, Ohio State still had 607 total yards, 10 yards per pass, and 6 yards per rush. The teams that Northwestern has faced all rank 52, 85, 98, 68, 89, 110, and 96 in total offense. 26, 77, 89, 60, 102, 108, and 76 in yards per play. No wonder their defense looks superb. Ohio State's one weakness is really on that offensive line, with Justin Fields having been sacked 15 total times. But Northwestern is bottom 20 in quarterback pressure with just 10 sacks on the season. So they get no help there. The one chance that the Wildcats do have is in generating turnovers. This defense has forced 12 interceptions. The problem with that is that Justin Fields has just three interceptions on the season and the team has lost just three fumbles. They do not give the ball away. So then you have to ask yourself, can this Northwestern team keep up offensively? As bad as the Ohio State defense has been compared to years past, their offense is, yes, largely improved from last season. They went from averaging 16 points per game to now 25, but they are 102nd in total offense, averaging 351 yards and 4.6 yards per play. Peyton Ramsey has a 59% completion, 9 touchdowns, 6 interceptions with a 5.8 average. Their run game is their strength, but they are 60th in rushing yards, averaging just 170 yards per game and 89th in efficiency with 3.9 yards per rush. So now you have to look at this Northwestern team and see you don't have a pass rush. Your best defense is interceptions, but you're facing a quarterback that doesn't throw interceptions. You yourself are turnover prone with six interceptions of your own and 11 fumbles, six lost. You can't pass. You can't run. And the best offensive team that you have faced is ranked 52nd in the country. Ohio State is ranked top 10. And as susceptible as Ohio State's defense is, they did give up 27 points to Rutgers. Yes, I think they can score, and Northwestern will still not be able to keep up. People get scared of a big spread, but I say it is big for a reason. This game is being played at the Colt Stadium. Weather is looking good, even if they do decide to retract the roof. Ohio State, minus 20 and a half. Now looking over to the SEC Championship, what could have been a potentially exciting game is now looking like it could be a potential dud. We have Alabama minus 17 versus Florida. The total in this game is 74 and a half. Now in all transparency, if you do follow me on Twitter, then you will know that I grabbed Alabama at minus 13 and a half. Is 17th still worth a grab? The last time that these two teams played was in 2016 in that SEC championship. Alabama beat Florida 54 to 19, and I see no reason, honestly, why it shouldn't be the same case here. I do think that this line should be closer to 21, and let me tell you why. The one big difference between these two teams is offense explosiveness, and of course, improvements on the defense. Both teams played A&M. Both ran the same number of plays at 22, and similar time of possession. Bama scored. Let me hear me out. In the same number of plays 
Alabama scored 52 points, had 544 yards, and 16.1 yards per pass. Florida, in the same number of plays, scored 38 points, had 402 yards of offense, and 9.8 yards per pass. Such a contrast difference. Both of, the, both of these teams also played Arkansas. And if you look at that, Bama held them to 13 plays, 188 yards, 6.4 yards per pass, and 3 points, while only while putting up 52 points of their own. Florida allowed 18 plays, 458 yards of offense, and 13.2 yards per pass, and 35 points. They needed to score 63 because their defense did nothing. Stark contrast difference between these two defenses. Similar stories against Kentucky, Tennessee, and of course LSU. And why is there such a contrast difference? When you are a one-dimensional offense like Florida is, then you eventually get figured out. The Florida Gators are 98th in rushing yards and average just 4.2 yards per rush. They don't have one running back who has crossed the 500-yard mark, and only one has surpassed 300. I get it. You have a great quarterback in Kyle Trask, but what happens when you don't have a good run game? Then you struggle to convert on third downs. Florida is 65th on converting on third downs. Alabama is top 25. Tell me who's going to have the ball more often and longer. Your already bad defense, ranked 124th in the country, is going to get gassed. And why? Because Alabama is a dual threat offense. Alabama can run. They have Najee Harris with 1,000 rushing yards, averaging 5.9 yards per rush. He himself has 22 touchdowns. Alabama is top 40 in rushing yards and top 25 in yards per rush. They are a very well-balanced offense. Alabama has 28 rushing touchdowns. Florida has 8. There is variety in their game, and you see it week after week, and the reason why they are scoring so much is because they can pass the ball and they can run the ball. And what happens when you're one-dimensional like Florida? Turnovers. Florida is minus one in turnover margin. Alabama is plus nine. Crimson Tide is top 25 in takeaways. Florida is 64th in giveaways. Even after giving up 48 points to 658 yards to Ole Miss, Alabama is still top 25 in total defense. I do think that Alabama has too much variety in their offense. They have a defense that has improved week after week throughout the season. And of course, I think they have the better coach. But Kyle Trask has 40 touchdowns. Yeah, well, Mac Jones and Alabama, they don't need to pad the stats. They will go to the game plan that wins. That is playing complimentary offense. So I do still believe that Alabama is the right side here. Alabama first half minus 10. This ticket has been cashing every week, and I think it cashes again this time around. And Alabama minus 17, full game. Finally, we move over to the Sun Belt in the game that I am looking forward to watching the most is Louisiana at Coastal Carolina, who is a three and a half home favorite. The total for this is 54 and a half. Yes, we have seen them play before. Yes, it was a three point game. What can be different this time around? The Raging Cajuns are one hell of a team, but what separates these two is Grayson McCall. Statistically, both teams are damn near the same in total offense, in yards per play, and in passing yards. What separates them is passing efficiency. When you are looking at who can sling the ball, that's definitely Grayson in this spot. Levi Lewis has 60% completion, 7.7 average, 17 touchdowns, and 7 interceptions. Grayson is a freshman, having himself a season. He has 69% completion, 10 yards per pass, 23 touchdowns, and 2 interceptions. And he runs. He has nearly 500 rushing yards on the ground for an additional 6 scores. But to be fair, Levi Lewis also runs, but he just runs a little less. 310 rushing yards for five scores. But both are similar in terms of rushing yards and yards per rush. So then who has the edge on defense? That's going to be Coastal Carolina. What also separates these two teams is their downs. Offensively, Coastal Carolina is finds a way to keep these drives alive. Louisiana is 88th in converting on thirds. Coastal Carolina is 9th best. Defensively, Louisiana is 114th in stopping third down conversions. Coastal Carolina is 9th best. I think we could definitely see that come into play in this game. 
Both have really great offensive lines, but another key difference here is that Louisiana is not good when it comes to applying quarterback pressure. This Louisiana defense has just 18 sacks to Coastal's 33. So now you want to tell me that you want to give Grayson McCall the opportunity to show you just how well of a quarterback he is. I really don't want to go into depth into this as much as I do with other games because I really do think that it is an anything you can do, I can do better scenario. Coastal leads in points per game, points per play, red zone attempts, red zone scores, giveaways, and takeaways. They rank bottom for field goal attempts because they're not scoring field goals, they're scoring touchdowns. Coastal is also the number one best team for penalties. They rarely have any. They're well coached, they have a great quarterback, and they have a solid overall They are balanced on both pass and the rush and have a great defense. I really don't like that hook, though, at three and a half. If this gets to three, then it does become a buy for me. This could be a game where we see them win by three, but honestly, I think they can win by seven. But I still am going to stick to instead Coastal Carolina on the money line at minus 160.